I think if it's okay with everybody, we'll just go ahead and dive into the panel discussion. Um, Norb, it looked to me like you had a question um, uh, at the end of Ricardo's presentation and maybe more. So why don't you go ahead? And yeah, I, I did. So let me, let me ask it now. So Ricardo, toward the end of your presentation, you talked about one of the caveats being that the, the regulations from state to state seem to vary. And that is again, causing confusion and problems. And I'm I guess my question to you, since I, I, I know very little about legal matters, if the, if, the federal, if, if the FDA came out with some overarching guidance, would that supersede what the states do or, or are the states still in control in terms of how these regulations apply within their, their jurisdiction? Wow, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, because we have a pharma, we have a federal law that explicitly said states get to decide what happens with hemp within their borders, right? And it, it is possible for Congress to pass a federal law that would, and the word we the term we use in, in the law is preemption, that would preempt any conflicting state laws. Um, Congress chose not to do that in this case, and in fact, seemed to have you know gone out of its way to go the other way. And I think that was part of the price to be paid for getting that bill passed in the first place, was allowing states who didn't want a hemp market in their borders to be able to opt out. So um, th there are certain FDA requirements uh, revolving around, let's say, nutrition labeling for which there are express preemption provisions in the Federal Food Drug Cosmetic Act. There are other requirements for which Congress remains silent. So there is no express preemption, but it could be possible to infer preemption or argue in favor of an implied preemption. But I'm not sure how you work around to that when you're faced with the federal law that says states can do what they want with respect to hemp. Um, but I, I'm sure I could come up with a whole dissertation if somebody's looking for a dissertation topic around that one issue. <laughs> I mean, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, some of our major food companies wanting perhaps to begin to develop and market products with the current confusion from state to state and the various laws. It just seems like that, that's an insurmountable uh, obstacle right now. It does seem maybe more challenging for some product categories than others to come up with a with a fifty state solution, um, but I think folks would be happy to try to grapple with that problem as opposed to the problem they have right now, which is they can't go forward at all. Yeah. Do you mind if I ask a follow up question really quick? Um, so, federally, it's my understanding that if CBD is purified from marijuana, it's still legal in a schedule one drug. So to your knowledge, do you know if FDA is trying to work with DOJ or DEA in order to, to figure that out? Because that's an additional level of complexity. Yeah, and, and I'm not a drug enforcement administration specialist. Um, you know, when you read the definitions of marijuana and hemp, they really turn on that THC content of 0.3%. Um, so I, I suspect uh, that DEA, you know, get, I think they just published an interim rule maybe what, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, basically setting out their interpretation of those farm bill provisions. Um, and that's been somewhat controversial and there's litigation over that. So I, I'm, I'm not sure, I, I guess I'm wondering why somebody would want to take on that battle, um, right? For oh. CBD derived from marijuana. Yeah, I, I don't think we do, but I, I battle, right? Over, over CBD derived from hemp. Yeah, sure, and and not from a food standpoint, from a research standpoint. Um, you know, we oh, are we are held to you know still Schedule One. CBD is Schedule One, so oh. <laughs> so it's just but, kind of a an additional level of. Um, 
complexity and paperwork and people saying, well, why can't you just go down the street and grab some CBD from, you know, the, the dispensary? And I mean, we clearly can't do that. But, but, but just the, the counter side of that is that um, you can order CBD from Sigma and you don't need a DEA um, uh, license or registration to do that. So the, the, this whole area is very, very confusing. I so mean, have you done that? We just I, them a few weeks ago. Oh, that's interesting. Because I was, I understood that you still had to have a license to get that. I hadn't tried it, but. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. For confusion. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, uh, us too. Oh, sorry. Yeah, us too. We we extensively tried to figure out if we needed a license for the Sigma CBD, and we were told no by our local DEA here in Hawaii. Interesting. Okay, any more on that? Um, there is a question in the Q&A box here. Um, I, this could probably uh, go to Ricardo or maybe Sylvia. But anyway, the question is, is there an easier pathway for minor cannabinoids um, in parentheses CBG or CBN into food um, if those are not active drug ingredients today or active drugs, I presume, yeah. Either. Sylvia, did you want to take first crack at that? Sure, gladly. Um, and so in the event that CBG or CBN have not been the subject of a, uh, a new drug application, uh, they can go down that NDIN pathway. Um, so that same exclusion uh, for CBD would not apply in those instances. Uh, I think it was mentioned a few times already with the NDIN process, there have been hemp-based products um, containing CBD where an NDIN was submitted and rejected by the FDA. And that would not be the case for these two constituents unless they have been the subject of a new drug investigation. And the only thing I'd add, Leon, because I'm not sure if the question was asking about use in only dietary supplements and also conventional foods. Uh, for conventional foods, of course, you have that food additive or grass pathway. Um, and I will say that, you know, I, I think the folks who uh, review food ingredient safety at FDA have been getting a, a little um, more and more concerned about what they describe as bioactive constituents being used as ingredients in food mm -hmm. and whether the, the pre-existing safety assessment paradigm that has traditionally been applied um, to food ingredients is adequate for some of these newer ingredients that seem to have a functionality that go beyond nutrition. Right. Uh, another question that's just come up is as follows. Most CBD products on the market are outside of NSF definition of CBD products. How is NSF envisioning uh, anyone applying for certification? Consumers are so far ahead of these requirements um, uh, that it makes it impossible to use NSF, I guess is, is, is a comment here. You wanna uh, respond to that? Yeah, no. Um... From experience, there are far more products that do not qualify than do. Um, that said, there is um, a, a scope of products that are eligible. Um, we've heard that feedback a lot, um, but in lieu of data where we can be more inclusive, especially in terms of the safety limit, um, we can stand behind that ADI uh, that we've established. And as the science um, provides data where we can substantiate a higher level at that point, NSF will evaluate um, raising our ADI for CBD. Um, but you're right, it's, it is low and it's a limitation, um, but it does create a window uh, for products to apply for certification, which in our opinion is better than saying zero. Okay, uh, next question. Um, 
RE California Prop 65, we have a complication uh, coming in January for CBD products with THC listed as a developmental toxicant a year ago. There is no MADL established yet, and I'm hearing that manufacturers may just be giving uh, may just be giving birth defects warnings on products sold in California. Any advice or comment from the panelists on that? So, uh, I mean, just briefly, the handwriting on the wall for that one has been there for quite some time, because I think it, California gave a one year notice. Um, uh, and so I think everybody knew that was coming, at least folks that were paying attention to that determination when it came down the pike. Um, and, and ultimately the fix is to get that safe harbor level, right? And, and if industry can't get that out of California, then you're kind of stuck with having to give this warning or be ready to, to put forward a showing that, that there is no uh, risk uh, based on the exposures associated with your product, which is not a place most people want to be because it's expensive and it's a defensive position and you still have to pay the lawyers in the litigation and all that. Um, so I, 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 don't have, I don't have, I'm sorry to say I don't have a solution for that one. I would not, uh, I think this is being uh, supposed by the questioner, I would not be surprised to see those warnings start to show up. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's kind of an unfortunate situation because if the warnings are everywhere, then they become diluted in value. Everybody just sort of learns to ignore them. There's also a paradox that um, we're trying to not use experimental animals unnecessarily. And so you get a product which is in widespread use. You can look at different populations you can use the available information to reach a conclusion. Um, and yet the only way to satisfy something like Prop 65 is actually do the study in, in, a, in an animal system to show it's not a developmental toxicant. And I think that's very unfortunate because I think we're trying to use existing data to the extent possible to make these judgments, particularly in something that's a, a novel food or a, or a food supplement and is being widely used. Um, Ricardo, here's a question specifically directed to you. Do you have any insight into the FDA's desire to better regulate supplements, i.e. a Deshay 2.0? Um, so that conversation has been unfolding now over the last several months. It really actually sort of started with the observance of the 25th anniversary of Deshay. And, and I, I would just recommend to folks who have an interest in that topic uh, go ahead and pull Steve Taves speeches on the FDA website. He's the current director of the Office of Dietary Supplements. I think he's been really transparent and very communicative about what he sees as the shortcomings in the existing law and the opportunities for, for, um, for addressing those shortcomings. So rather than, you know, uh, take a, a chance on misrepresenting his views on all that, I would just point people to, to the FDA website. And, I, and I'm, I'm sure that at least one of his recent speeches is gonna be available through that website. And, and he'll talk about things like, you know, product uh, re, uh, registration and listing um, and other things that he sees as, as fixes to the existing system. Okay. Anybody else wanna comment on that at all? Um, here's another question uh, directed uh, to you, Sylvia. Uh, is the NF maybe is the NSF concerned on what we just heard about the lack of data on endpoints of concern for C CBD? And does this possibly preclude the um, uh, possibility of setting an ADI? Yeah, I think this ties into the earlier question that, you know, concerns around our criteria being so restrictive that many of these products aren't eligible. Um, and referring back to Brad's presentation earlier today, we have established an ADI, but again, it is low compared to a lot of products that are on the market. Um, and that is due to the lack of data. And so we're hopeful that as more data becomes available, uh, this 
state of the science will allow a higher ADI that will be more inclusive uh, for these products that are reasonably expected to be safe, um, but data is limiting right now. Um, another question um, maybe that I have is, um, let's say for the moment that um, I'm uh, leading a regulatory and safety organization within a business that is a food producing business, for example, and I, my product development team comes to me and says, um, how do I legally and safely market, let's just pick a couple of products, say gummy bears and a, and a beverage, um, to both be, be compliant, and, and since this is regulatory, let's focus on the regulatory side of this. How do we, how do we thread the needle with, um, uh, with the product that we develop to ensure that we are as compliant as we possibly can be? And can we ultimately find that what seems to me to be a very small opening in that needle? Can we thread our way through that and, and produce a product that uh, would, would meet the regulatory requirements? Say it, it probably easier or more difficult at the federal level. What, what would be some key points that I should share with my product development team and the folks writing labels and the advertising department and so forth, um, either Ricardo or Sylvia? I'll let Ricardo start, then I'll follow. <laughs> We're all going to try to buy some time to think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, so everything starts with it, with formulation um, and, and figuring out the regulatory status of your ingredients, right? And so right away, you have this problem. Now, it, it is not an unsolvable problem in the sense that um, while I think FDA is suggesting that it views any hemp derivative that contains CBD as a quote unquote CBD product, I'm not sure FDA has been entirely clear, right, about how far it's prepared to go. Um, so clearly a CBD isolate, you know, FDA is gonna look at that and say, you can't market that as a supplement or, or, or add that to food. And, and perhaps, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, back to the nice inverted pyramid uh, that we saw from Sylvia, you know, as, as you work your way up that pyramid away from an isolate um, to the point where you get to an extract where essentially everything present in, in hemp is represented um, and your CBD level is like, you know, a two, two to 3% of um, this mixture, right? What does that have to do with the approval of epidiolex? Um, I think there's, there's, there, there's a pretty solid argument that it doesn't have anything to do with the approval of epidiolex and that FDA is really kind of misreading the law and casting its net a little too widely in interpreting that provision. You know, but their position is their position. So I, I think that that first question is, are you willing to adopt a position that is perhaps at odds with that of FDA and, and at the risk of disagreement. Um, and some companies are prepared to go there and, and others aren't. And, and in point of fact, sometimes FDA does make mistakes and it does misread or misapply the law. And that's how we end up with these cases that, that end up telling FDA they got it wrong. Mm -hmm. So it does happen. And some companies are, are sort of willing to, to contemplate that, that approach. Now, if you can get past that, then you have you know, all the other typical considerations that you'd be dealing with, right? Um, and I think as a practical reality, you know, people tend to sort of start on the back end, like what, what market hole am I trying to fill here? What's my niche? What claim do I need to make to be successful with this product in this category? And then sort of work their way back away from that to say, okay, how, how am I gonna formulate it to get there? And assuming that the claim is permissible. We've talked about the, the kinds of claims you can make or you can't make. So it's kind of like, you know, working, starting at the front end, working forward, but also thinking about it on the back end and working backward to look at all those things you're going to have to figure out, your ingredient sourcing, your formulation, any manufacturing requirements and challenges you're going to face there. Uh, uh, and then, you know, how you're going to label this thing and how you're going to advertise it. So that is a, in a nutshell, 
that was my stab at it, Sylvia, and I've had a few minutes to think. <laughs> well, the non-lawyer answer that I'm gonna give now, um, if your product is not um, being sold in accordance with one of those three grass dossiers, I there's really nothing that you can point at in the US regulations that it is legal. And so selling a product and marketing a, a product and my presentation was on dietary supplements, so I'll stick with that scope. There is nothing you can point at with complete certainty and say, this is legal. That's the reality. And so um, those parameters that I was sharing, they're risk mitigation techniques. And in Ricardo's um, talk, he mentioned FDA's focus on safety, right? And so we've had a number of presentations today that talked about an acceptable daily intake, uh, being focused on safety contamination. Are you following all of the regulations uh, under FDA ensuring that your product is not contaminated, isn't adulterated? And then thirdly, that the product actually contains what it's meant to contain. And regardless if this is hemp or any other botanical, um, those products need uh, to follow all of those regulations stipulated by FDA. Um, and companies that really pursue marketing and highly market those CBD claims, um, both the quantitative claim on the label and those egregious uh, disease claims, um, their risk mitigation techniques are uh, basically calling FTC and asking for a warning letter. And so it's all about risk mitigation. There isn't really zero risk in this category um, and being mindful that you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's with all of the regulations that apply to the product category um, that applies to you. That, I think um, what's gone before is a problem for us now in that um, not everyone has done a due diligence. So let's take, for example, the issue of the CBD extract, food grade, genotoxicity testing. Now I suspect it's not genotoxic, but the problem is the testing wasn't very good. So there's a question mark. So the regulators then say, is it genotoxic? Do a proper test and show me it's not. But then the next company has to do that as well because every product is now going to be treated as a potential concern Whereas if the initial study had been really good and we did a proper um, product characterization, we could have said, look, there's nothing in here of concern. We've shown the product isn't genotoxic with, with these constituents present, therefore you don't need to worry about it. So it's like, the, um, like the, uh, some of the claims. The problem now is that it's a gray area because we all know the extreme claim is a, is a, a medical claim, is not allowed. Another one is a general well-being claim is perfectly acceptable. There's a bunch in the middle, which really are only decided when it goes to court or a regulatory authority who says, well, I think that's a medical claim. You know, you're saying it's improving memory. Is that a medical claim? Probably not, but in the case of dementia, it would be. And it varies from legislation to legislation, of course, regulation to regulation. No, no shortage of challenges for sure. <laughs> um, Alan, what, what do you foresee um, happening to products um, in the UK, uh, given particularly the stipulation that um, yeah. uh, the, the dossiers need to be submitted in, uh, in March 2021? And, you know, I, I gathered from what you said, um, and, you know, what you not only in your presentation, but what mm -hmm. you just said, there's going to be some real data shortages showing up. Uh, along with those dossiers. How, where, what do you think that portends for, um, uh, for folks in the business there? In the UK? A tough time. I know that already. Um, the ACNFP have begun to look at this as, a, as an exercise. Um, the, um, it's clear that the information that um, is readily available is not enough. And so how the companies are going to put together a sufficient dossier to satisfy the ACNFP to get an authorization uh, is unclear. 
I think it may take an iterative process when they go to the uh, committee and they say, well, these are the things that we need and go and get the information. And it's not like a um, pesticide authorization, you can get um, several goes at it. But um, it's going to be a huge impact on the UK market because essentially every product after spring next year will be illegal until it's authorized. And they're everywhere. You know, I go into my local um, uh, herb, it's called health food store. And there's a whole rack full of CBD products. Is the answer to everything. And we, um, it was touched on by one of your speakers this afternoon. Um, we will, and I didn't go into it in my presentation, but we were being approached now about the cosmetics use of CBD and a concern about aggregate exposure through its use in food and as a topical, and possibly also other inhalation, but probably lower. It's, it's a, an interesting challenge. The whole thing about uh, cumulative uh, doses and so forth is a, another a whole whole big challenge. So, okay, let's see. How are we doing time-wise? I think, um, uh, does, does anybody have a, a, a real quick question? I, um, I see one here. I'm not sure I quite understand it, but I'll ask it. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you be open to working with industry or individual countries to refine or change CBD definition using data? Um, not sure I exactly understand what that question means. Um, I think CBD is CBD. Uh, let me move on from that one then. Uh, Alan, I'm sure you've got your eye on the EU's dropping of the novel foods pathway. Do you know if it's a final decision? I don't know what's happening in the, in the EU, but of course we're about to leave the EU and um, we've set up a process for novel foods in the UK. So for the time being, we'll be treating them as we have been in the past. But, uh, I don't know what's happening in Europe. Okay. All right. Well, I think we're at the uh, at the end of our time that's uh, available. I want to thank the three of you for uh, giving a wonderful presentation, so all three of you. And uh, I think it was a great discussion. And it's really clear that this is a challenging area. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for your hard work and uh, helping to bring some clarity to, to um, as I said, something that's really tough. So, Norm, back to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Leon, for moderating that last session. So uh, I know it's getting late in the day, so I'm just going to keep my comments fairly brief. So first of all, I want to thank all of our, our speakers for excellent presentations. And you know, there are many, many take home messages from these presentations, but I'll just mention a, and reiterate a few of these. You know, clearly, there are many, many data gaps still concerning the, the safety of a substance that is not only widely used, but CBD products seem to be continuing to increase. And, and so, you know, this certainly is a concern. The, the other thing that relates to this, and we heard about this uh, yesterday, is that we're not even clear what the mechanism of action is by which CBD mediates its biological activity. So that again, makes it even more difficult to understand potential safety um, concerns. Um, likewise, you know, there are many, many products on the market and there are many questions about the purity of these products and also the quantity of CBD in these products. And as we just heard in this last session, um, certainly the regulatory landscape uh, for CBD products is, is very, very murky and continues to change. And so um, I guess we'll just have to wait and see how some of this uh, evolves. Uh, I also want to thank the participants um, over the last two days and their excellent questions. Um, I also need to, to acknowledge and thank the Chris Emerging Issue Com Issues Committee uh, for their assistance in, in putting together and developing this year's program. Um, I'd be remiss also if I didn't thank Casey Baldwin, our administrative assistant for all the logistical support and trying to pull off this virtual meeting this year and uh, Elizabeth Anderson for, the, um, for promoting 
um, helping us promote this, uh, this year's symposium. So thank you everybody. And um, we hope that next year we will have an, again, an in-person meeting, but until then, um, I, hope, I hope everyone is doing well and uh, thank you again for participating. So with that, I will uh, adjourn our meeting and again, thank everybody for their participation. Thanks, Neil. All right.